Hey everyone, Todd Sachs of Sachs Realty and welcome to this week's Real Estate Q&A. As you can probably see by my surroundings, I'm not at home. I'm on a business trip in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And the reason that I came here is obviously everybody knows the state of the economy is a complete train wreck right now. It's a mess. And I believe that we are headed into a real housing crisis, leaving everything else aside, not counting credit card debt, the amount of national debt that we have, and, and really all the other things that are going on. One thing I know for sure in my industry is that people are really struggling to buy a home. We know that you need five, six, eight times your income now to buy a house. And you know, traditionally, historically, you've been able to buy a home in the past for three to four times earnings. So if you made $100,000 a year, you could buy a $400,000 house. We know right now it's just not possible to achieve such a thing. So with the high interest rates, you know, we did have a little dip where we, you know, uh, mortgage rates dropped like a quarter of a point. No big deal. Inconsequential, really, uh, when you're looking at the overall picture and the amount of the payments. So what I came here for was to interview Peter Schiff that predicted the 2008 crisis, Mike Maloney, who believes that we should actually own some physical gold and make sure that we're very prepared for a crash in a dollar. Uh, I interviewed Brent Johnson, uh, who has uh, Santiago Capital. He believes the dollar is going to be strong. So, And finally, I interviewed a guy named James Hickman. He is known as the sovereign man. He went to West Point. He was in the Army Intelligence. Uh, he was an Army Intelligence officer. Uh, and these guys collectively over the past couple of days have really given me a lot of insight. I'm excited to bring the content to you uh, just so that you can have a broader understanding of what is really going on. And for many of my audience that's really waiting to buy a home, um, you know, should you be buying right now? Should you be renting? I mean, there's, it's just everything is really a mess. But anyway, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about this big commissions trial that has been in the news because everybody's asking questions about it. They're making comments. And you see the plaintiffs uh, about two weeks ago won the lawsuit, the commission's lawsuit against some of the nation's largest brokers and the National Association of Realtors. And what they believe, what the plaintiffs kind of convinced the jury of, is that the commissions has been some type of a conspiracy between the brokers and National Association of Realtors to keep commissions elevated, which they believe has cost buyers and sellers literally billions of dollars over a whole bunch of years. And what I wanna talk about is some of the potential outcome that can come from that because once we put all that aside now it's being appealed right now uh we know that we know it's going to be years before it's decided but the attorney that was successful in this case immediately after the release of the outcome from the the jury filed a whole bunch of other lawsuits pertaining to the same but under different brokerages going after different brokerages um you know and and really we have another case that is pending trial in the spring uh, for 10 times the amount. This was a $4 million uh, case that, that they were asking for. And the one in the spring is a $40 million. So this kind of opened up, paved the way. But what really everyone should be concerned about is yet to you know hit this thing in a way where the federal government steps in and gets involved and makes it illegal um, for the listing agent to cooperate. See, that's what it's all about. Uh, the seller hires the listing broker, uh, agrees to pay a commission for the, the whole sale of the house. And then what happens is that listing broker takes a portion, they fee share uh, the portion of what the seller agrees to pay, and they give that a portion of it to a buyer's broker that successfully brings the buyer to the settlement table. And so that's kind of the way things that are working right now. But I want to talk about what some of the outcomes could be, because I think that we actually, if they're successful getting what they want, it may not be in the best interest of the public. And, you know, the, the sellers, not so much, but I'm really talking about it. it may not be in the best interest of the buyer, especially if you're a home buyer. So let's just talk about a couple of these scenarios that could play out. Now, before we look at the scenarios, let me just say that I do agree with 
a portion of what the plaintiffs alleged. Well, not really, what they won. The issue is, is that a buyer's agent can really be, if they are a dishonest type of person, they can really steer, especially first time buyers, into a sale or a purchase of a home that better benefits the agent. What I mean by this is the agent can commission shop on the MLS. So the way it's set up right now, the listing broker shares, remember, with the buyer's broker a portion of their commission. This may be a, obviously it's negotiable, so it's variable, right? So let's just say a buyer's agent's looking at properties for their buyer, and the buyer says, I'm interested in these three or four properties. The buyer's agent can commission shop and say, wow, I like this one because if I sell them this house, I can make more money. So what could happen and probably has happened is that the buyer's agent takes their buyer to the, see the house. But let's just say that this particular house is the least commission, right? The issue that they have with, and I'm not disagreeing that this isn't an issue, but the issue they are saying is that that agent really has a lot of influence on a first time buyer, especially, right? The buyer may say, I really like this house, but in their mind, they're going, yeah, but I'm not making as much money here. They could say things like, well, but look at this and look at that. And this is a bad HVAC or this is going to happen. You're going to spend a lot of money or this is the problem with this area or whatever they could. Right. And they could influence the buyer's decision. They could take them to the other house where they could make more money. And then all of a sudden the buyer may not like it as much, but they may say, yeah, but look at this potential or that or whatever, whatever. Now, conventional wisdom that says that well, the buyer's making the decision. So that's the argument with the agent, right? Like that won't happen because the buyer's the one that decides. Let me tell you, buyers are very vulnerable, especially these first time buyers. Um, they don't want to make a mistake. They want to trust their agent. It may be a friend of theirs even, or a family friend or what have you. So I do know that the system is kind of, it is kind of, it can be broken as any system, right? In whatever you decide to buy or or, or, or sell or whatever. There's, there's flaws in every system. But let's go over these scenarios. So let's say scenario one, the law requires the buyers to pay their own agent's commission. Well, the issue with this is that most home buyers don't have enough money even to put down on the house, right? They're getting gift money from mom and dad. Uh, they, there are fees that are associated with loan originations. Uh, they have to come up with that. Then any minimum down payment amounts and things like that. Uh, so what this may prevent is a buyer to have representation at all. And our first time buyers really are the ones that need it the most. Now the mortgage industry has suggested signaling that if that's the case, they will find a way to finance the buyer's commission in with their monthly payments. So the buyer can actually pay for the commission over the next 30 years in with their principal interest and in any mortgage insurance that they might have. So what that would result is they would pay double for their commission and it would raise their monthly payment. So that's not really ideal either, right? The other scenario with that is that maybe the buyer just waives the right to representation and they just fall into the hands of the listing agent. I mean, after all, dual agency in some states where the listing agent can actually represent the buyer at the same time sounds ridiculous it is ridiculous in my opinion how could any agent represent the interest of both parties uh, but there may be a situation if that were law that uh, the buyer just can't afford to have an agent another scenario may be that the seller is required to pay the buyer's agent directly so now the seller in this scenario has to pick and choose between who they think is best to get paid they may say in this case, right, agents don't want to hear this, but if the seller is responsible for paying the buyer's agent, they may just say, well, I think the buyer's agent is more important than my listing agent. Because after all, there are brokers out there right now that for a fee will put the home seller's home on the market. Uh, the home seller can certainly hire a photographer, can hire somebody to do 3D tours, drone videos, all these types of things. And so the seller may actually think in this case that the buyer's agent is more important because after all, the buyer brings the money, right? And without the money, that's like the most important thing to the seller. And if we had to lay out both of them, do you think it's more important that a buyer gets represented or that a seller gets represented, right? Because the buyer, a good buyer's agent is going to 
really make sure that that house is good for their buyer if they're a good agent, right? But then in that case, we have to look at it. We go, well, that's kind of screwed up because now the seller is offering, just like now, the buyer's agent a fee to negotiate against them. So that's kind of crazy. And then finally, I guess the scenario that I think may play out is absolutely nothing changes at all. It basically stays the same way that it is. Um, and then just fees and commissions just come down. And really, I think it's what they're really more interested in having happen because I think that the public at large just doesn't realize that commissions should be negotiable. A lot of agents, they do some very bad things. Like they say, like, this is the going rate or this is the industry average. I've actually heard it with my own ears. And, you know, so that's a lie. It's not true. There is no standard. There is no industry average. It shouldn't be, right? To be fair about it, you as the client should have the right to inquire about negotiating on what that fee or commission would be to have either, you know, really the, the buyer or seller's uh, agent represent you. You should know what that fee expectation is. You should have a conversation. It should be in writing, in my opinion, Maryland, where we are. It's a statutory state, which means everything has to be in writing as it pertains to real estate. Um, but a lot of people don't want to talk about that because they're like, I don't want to have a commission conversation uh, because, you know, then I'll get paid less or whatever. But you know what? A good agent is always worth their money. Um, you know, it, it, they're going to save the buyer or the seller. Uh, and usually I haven't had buyers or sellers complain about what I've been paid um, personally uh, or my agents. I, I, it's never been an issue. Uh, because you know a good agent is going to work very hard and everybody knows that people need to make money or they'd be out of business so you know i don't think it's just we can't just be ignorant and say we don't need these agents and things like that because guys i hate to tell you it's just not true i've been in this business a long time and uh, you know uh, good representation is needed people say things all the time like well we'll just get a real estate lawyer or whatever yeah good luck with that i want to see how much a lawyer is going to charge you to drive you around and look at 15 houses, put in 25 offers, whatever, right? You will spend way more money, believe me. We are hitting a gnat with a sledgehammer. I'm not saying that it shouldn't be revamped, that the public should not have better transparency, but that's what I think we need to work on. I think that needs to be the negotiated outcome. Now, I don't think that the National Association of Realtors should have the control that they have. That's what we need to improve upon. Because if we have a, you know, a kingpin at the top of the chain that is demanding and regulating and, and that could make a business's cost become more expensive. Um, so I, I think that there are things we, we shouldn't have in this business. Somebody saying, well, if you're not a member of this association, you don't have access to the MLS. You don't have access to the properties, electronic lockbox systems without going through the listing agent, a whole bunch of things that tie your hands behind your back because Let's face it, I mean, I can tell you firsthand, agents don't answer the phones, most of them. So I can't imagine, hey, um, by the way, uh, I'm not a member of the National Association of Realtors. Can I schedule a time and have you meet us at your clients? I have a buyer that wants to, shouldn't have to do that, right? But anyway, guys, let's jump into some of these comments and questions. All right, now, so I am outside, so I need to take a look at my phone for this. And by the way, guys, if you can't tell, it's pretty cloudy out there. I'm starting to get a little bit wet. It has rained pretty much since we got here. I mean, we do have sunshine. This morning was beautiful, uh, but we see monsoons, people walking down the street with 18 inches of water knee high. All right, so our first commenter pertains to just what I'm saying here. It says dual agency will be unavoidable. They're in Washington. Buyer brokers do not receive a payment of compensation for their services. And this is exactly what I'm talking about here. Dual agency, in my opinion, should be banned in all 50 states in DC. It's not. Um, the belief, you know, so me as a broker, I can be a dual agent in Maryland, but I have to have a designated buyer's agent and a designated listing agent. These two cannot commingle, right? Confidentiality has to stay in between them. Um, when you have a dual agent, you're hearing what the buyer's saying, what the seller's saying, and now you're getting compensated to make this deal work financially. And who do you pick? What side do you pick? 
Do you think you can represent both opposing parties? Absolutely not. So what this comment is saying is really scary because if the buyer is forced to pay their own commission out of pocket or finance it for 30 years, come on. I mean, they're going to be like, ah, oh, I just want to go. A lot of these buyers, they're, they're just like, hey, just sell, please, please just help me get the house listing agent. Just help me get it, right? So this is the problem. Our next comment says, uh, corporations are buying up single family homes. If you follow your local MLS, you'll see a low but steady stream of homes going under contract. One of the conversations that I had with Peter Schiff uh, while we were here was, how do these corporations keep buying uh, you know, up all these houses? That's a big question, right? Like, how's it happen? All right, well, if you're paying an interest rate for, to buy a house, you can pretty much guarantee that somebody in, on a corporate level, that a corporate buyer, whatever it is, is paying a lot lower financing costs than what you are. So if you look at it and we're dealing with cash flows and it's based on payments and these investors are buying houses based on cash flow, the interest payment alone for the first five years, all you do is pay interest payments. So the amount of finance, you know, the cost of financing has everything to do with your ability to cash flow. So if these investors can pull money together, right? They're, uh, they have whatever they need from the SEC to pull money together and they go out and buy these properties. Well, that's one way to have cheap finance. The other way is to be able to, you know, put these big conglomerates together and just get corporate financing. And for them, it's a lot less expensive. So they can keep buying, keep paying. They're just waiting around, man. Like they're just tasting the blood that they taste back in 2012 when, you know, Obama bundled up all of these loans and fed it to, and I'm not saying it's good or bad, whatever. Well, I am saying it was bad. We know now it was bad because one in four single family houses are owned by these corporations. That some experts say will go to 40% uh, in just a couple of years, 40% of the single family houses will be owned by these investors. But we had so much foreclosure, so much bad real estate. Grass was tall, board ups everywhere in the neighborhoods that what they did was they came up with this you know, idea that they would bundle these loans together, these houses, they would sell them to Wall Street for pennies on the dollar, Wall Street businesses, and then basically they had to rent them back. Well, guess what? From 2012, we've seen nothing but sunshine and beauty, right? Great days ahead, right? So the appreciation has been going up in single family houses. And as a result, I mean, these corporations have made a lot of money, right? They put renters in. Now it's even more important to have rentals because people can't afford to buy houses. So that's why we're seeing, you know, uh, institutional buyers just ready to go with their cash, just hoping that there's a collapse. Something else that Peter Schiff said too was, and I never thought about it this way before, but when we think about, let's just say over the last couple of years, a buyer bought a house or they refinanced something that they bought 10 years ago, 15 years ago for a low interest mortgage rate, like under 4%, that is their asset. So what Peter Schiff said, is that all of these banks are being basically strangled by having these cheap loans on the books, but, and, and they kind of, in a way, are hoping that the buyers do default so that they can get the asset back, sell the house for more, and be able to turn that money around into a loan that's now seven or eight percent instead of 2.75 percent. So, you know, that's a great interview that'll be coming to you soon. Uh, so let's move on. This next commenter is talking about a comment that I made a couple times about Barbara Corcoran's idea that if we get interest rates that are anywhere with a five in them, that you will see home prices go up. I think at one point she said 10, 15, 20 percent uh, fast, that it's just going to zoom right on up. And what I said was, man, that's crazy, right? Because buyers right now, they're tapped out, as I said earlier. We're seeing buyers need to do something like uh, five, six, eight times earnings to get a house. They can't afford that. I don't care if you drop the interest rate to five and a half percent, six percent, because now we have more debt. So as these banks, these lenders are really retracting because there's less money available, they're scrutinizing borrowers a lot more, which they should be doing anyway. The government, everybody should be doing that, right? not just handing out loans to people that may default or in their first couple of years. 
But what happens is now their debt to income ratios are out of whack. And that's why some lenders are saying, well, we'll just give them up to 60%. Let them have debt to income ratio of 60% debt to the income that they make. And as long as they fall within that, guys, let me tell you, these buyers, I hope they're smarter than that, right? So I don't think by dropping interest rates, you maybe get some, getting some people, some buyers refinancing, if they can get a five and a half mortgage rate, uh, again, percent mortgage rate, if they bought it 8%, uh, they may refinance and that works out great if it ever happens. I don't think it will, not in the next year or so anyway. Uh, but anyway, this commenter is saying that Barbara Corcoran is right and then really they go on to talk about uh, the Florida market. So this is a video that I did about Florida prices dropping, unstoppable price drops. And they're saying that it won't happen basically, that the price drops won't continue, won't happen at all, really because of the cheap financing that a lot of these buyers have gotten. But let me tell you a little secret about Florida. How much is a home worth where you can't get property insurance? When you buy a home, you are telling the lender that you will keep a policy, a homeowner policy to protect that lender's asset, the house, in the event something happens to it, that their money just doesn't go right into the ocean maybe that's behind me. So what happens is when, and it's going on right now, insurance companies are sending cancellation notices out to people that have homes in areas that are high risk for bad weather events let me tell you something unless you had the cash to buy the house when you go when you sell it unless a buyer has the cash your property value is going to tank if you can't get insurance the bad thing is is the government actually encouraged builders to develop in a lot of flood zone areas saying that they would provide you know fema based insurance and things like that but it's limited on the amount that you can get and when you go over that, it becomes very expensive. So I hope you're right about your Florida market. More to come on that. We'll just see how it plays out. All right, our next commenter says, I sold all real estate off between 2016 and 2018. And this is about, you know, uh, our last Tuesday Night Live where this commenter is, you know, making a comment about real estate and gold because we said with our guest, Mike Maloney, so, you know, I want to first say I'm not a financial advisor, so, you know, I'm a real estate broker, but Mike believes that we should all have physical gold in our portfolio. But this commenter is saying that they missed the boat, right? Uh, that they missed the golden opportunity to sell at the top of the market. And what I have to say to you is, you know, when we're dealing with uh, markets in general, my experience is you can't time the top and the bottom of the market. You never know what's going to happen. What I can tell you is with real estate is that when some buyer makes a decision to purchase a piece of property, the value of that real estate lies in the hands of the available buyer pool and what they're willing to pay. We watch that happen in a very high tide, right? With real estate, people paying over appraised value, it kind of raised the comps. The issue is if you buy 10,000 Apple shares, right? As an investor, or sell 10,000 Apple shares, you're not gonna move that market price one bit, right? They'll probably be inconsequential. But when sellers and buyers of housing, whatever their motivation is to buy or sell, they really can move the market quite rapidly. I'll give you an example, if you have a panic seller, a distressed seller, it doesn't mean that the house has to be distressed. But for whatever motivation, they have the ability to sell that house for $100,000 less than what was typically sold in the market over the last year. They will majorly swing that market down and that could happen fast. So what I'm telling everybody out there, look, don't try and time the ups and the downs of this real estate market. Make decisions wisely and know that the market can shift fast. And our final comment here is, it's surprising to hear those who don't fully understand the housing market, basically supply and demand trumps rising interest rates. Sales are dropping due to lack of inventory. Nationwide, 29% of the buyers are paying cash. Now look, I don't know what kind of qualifications you have that are commenting this, right? But you know, I do think that it's been about 30% of the market has been a cash buyer and they have been investors or second home buyers that sold their house at the top of the market and now they had a pocket full of cash and they went ahead 
and bought. And I can also tell you with the cash sales I have seen recently where the parents had a lot of money and the kids were buying a house and instead of paying an 8% 30-year mortgage rate, the parents did the loan, the mortgage on the house um, and that was one way, but that still wasn't cash, that was a loan. So yes, I do see cash transactions happening, but they're less now because the institutional buyers are actually waiting for the prices, they're expecting prices to drop. And they're kind of waiting, sitting around waiting for that. Uh, before they jump back in with both feet. Uh, but what I will say about your supply and demand is you're 100% right. You know, it is based on supply and demand. But all of the limited supply in the world would only lead to stagflation if no one can afford to buy it. So anyway, guys, we'll watch as this thing unfolds. Obviously, we have, you know, some critical months ahead. We got a long winter. And honestly, until we hit 2025, who knows where this thing's gonna play out with the election year. Thanks so much for watching. If you liked the video, you can let me know you did by hitting that thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so now. Hit the alert bell. You'll know every time I upload content. And finally, I wanna tell you, if you want your comment or question read on the next real estate Q&A, go ahead and drop them below and I just may pick yours. See you next time. Sachs Realty, Maryland broker number 607720, office number 443-318-4514, equal housing opportunity.